Good morning and good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It is Wacky and Weird Wednesday, so we're going to be looking at things that are wacky and weird happening in our political, environmental, social, uh, just the world. Because what is this? This is Before Coffee, the father and daughter conference news of Planet Earth podcast, where we look at the news 10 to 15 minutes before we start without any caffeine in our body, and we try to get through these headlines. So let's read them out for you, shall we? Today on Before Coffee, Hemi Badenoch says up to 50,000 very, very bad civil servants should be jailed. Montana man gets six months in prison for cloning a giant sheep. That's weird. What else is weird? DirecTV buys Dish Network for $1. Swedish government accused of trying to outlaw poverty over a begging ban plan. More weird news, evidence of negative time found in quantum physics experiment. In our culture weird news, are you oh Okay, then head to London's Emo Retrospective Exhibition. And it's National Coffee with a Cop Day, October 2nd, 2024, on Before Coffee with a Cop. Coffee with a Cop. I don't know if I could do it. Sounds scary. Even though I don't live in the U.S., Cops are still scary to me. I don't like being around people who can arrest me. <laughs> You've done a crime! Don't talk to me. Don't even look at me. Get away from me. <laughs> they just people. Yeah. Speaking of people who uh, should be jailed, there's my segue. Kenny Badenoch, um, this is on <laughs> The Independent by Millie Cook a polit political correspondent at The Independent. Kimmy Badenoch had sparked backlash after joking that 50,000 civil servants were so, so bad at their jobs, they should be jailed, claiming they undermine ministers and leak official secrets. Speaking on the fringes of the Conservative Party conference in Birmingham, MS Badenoch, Badenoch drew laughter from the audience as she said five to 10% of government department staff should be in prison. Talk about saying the quiet part loud. In a stinging attack on the workforce, he described some as very, very bad. With more than 500,000 people employed full-time in the civil service as of, as of March 2024, 5 to 10% would amount to between 25,000 to 50,000 staff members. I mean, they all can't, can't all be good, but you don't need to tell us. In response, a spokesperson, for the Public and Commercial Services PCS Union, the largest trade union representing civil servants in the UK, accused the Tory leadership contender of continuing a personal feud after she was accused of bullying members of staff earlier this year. Claims she dismissed. Oh, so it's the the what is it called? Pot calling the kettle black situation. You know, I am a bad civil servant, and so are a lot of you. I know, because I've done it. At the event hosted mm -hmm. by The Spectator magazine, Miss Badenoch said, I think that civil servants are like everybody else. They come in to do a job, and I would say about 10% of them are absolutely magnificent. The trick is being a good minister is to find the good ones quickly, bring them close, and try to get the bad ones out of your department as quickly as possible. There was about five... <clears throat> There's about 5% to 10% of them who are very, very bad, you know, should be in prison bad. That's not very, very bad. That's just criminals. I think she didn't want to say the word criminals. There's 5 to 10% who are actual criminals. Leaking official secrets, undermining the ministers, agitating. I had some of it in my department, usually union-led, but most of them actually want to do a good job. And the good ones are very frustrated by the bad ones. Okay, we're just naming the obvious here. I love when my bad coworker continues to do a bad job and nothing bad happens. Responding to her remarks, the PCS spokesperson said, Hemi Badenoch just can't let it lie, can she? When she was in power, she was accused of bullying civil servants. Now she's out of power and she's continuing her personal feud against them, many of whom are our members. This is a below-the-belt attack on hard-working civil servants who can't answer back. 
don't stand for our members being used to vote as vote fodder for the Tory party leadership election. Maybe Badenoch should reflect on her words, the way she treats civil servants and why Tories lost the general election. Ha 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 ha! Get slammed by the union. In July, the former cabinet minister was alleged to have created an intimidating atmosphere at the Department of Business and Trade in the report by the Guardian newspaper. Sources claim Ms. Badenoch was responsible for behavior that traumatized staff, leading at least three of them to leave their jobs in the department. Ah, yeah, so more wacky behavior. She dismissed the accusations because nobody would ever say, you know what, you're right, I bullied all those civil servants, you caught me. Smears claiming they originated from formal staff who I sacked after they were accused of bullying behavior, lying about other colleagues, cover their own failures, and general gross incompetence. So, not a serious story, but a wacky story, other nonetheless. Um, we got a, a, the first comment here, I think, probably is uh, Mrs. Badenoch forgets that, unlike her. These people are employed. They applied for their jobs, were interviewed, and were successful. The process is rigorous, as far as any such process is, and far more so than in the private sector in my experience. Miss Badenoch would do well to remember that when in office she was also a servant, a small point that she appears to have forgotten, like a lot of her kind. So, on July 30th, 2024, The Guardian published allegations which Badenoch was accused of creating intimidating atmosphere in the government department she used to run, with some colleagues describing it as toxic. Morale was said to be so low in the Department for Business and Trade last year that senior officials thought it necessary to address concerns about the working culture during an official town hall meeting. It was so bad they had to let everyone in the town hall know. Guys, we just want to let you know. The Trade and Business Department, morale is low. What can we do to fix this? This was attended to about 70 staff in person and online by 13 in December 2023. The fact that a town hall was hired, it is costly to hire a town hall, and further that a 70 of her staff attended speaks volumes. Today at the town hall we're going to cover how bad Badenoch is treating the department. And maybe think of some ideas of how to get rid of her. But that's my wacky weird story about UK politics. and. It's the blame game of you guys are bad and I'm one of them, I guess, is she, what she's kind of admitting here. <laughs> Weird thing to admit, but she did it, I guess. Yeah. That's my story. Okay. So we're going to go from that on to cloning of sheep. Can't think of a new one, but this goes to Montana. This is from AP News Montana. Uh, Amy Beth Hansen. An 81 year old Montana man was sentenced Monday to six months in federal prison for illegally using tissue and testicles from a large sheep hunted in Central Asia and the US to create hybrid sheep for captive trophy hunting in Texas and Minnesota. Well, I don't see any harm so far. What's going on here? U.S. District Judge Court Judge U.S. District Court Judge Brian Morris said he struggled to come up with a sentence for Arthur Jack Sherbarth of Vaughan, Montana. He said he weighed Sherbarth's age and lack of criminal record with a sentence that would deter anyone else from trying to change the genetic makeup of the creatures of the earth. Still don't see the problem here. We've been making mules for years. Morris also fined Schubert $20,000 in order to make $4,000 payment to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Schubert will be allowed to self-report to a Bureau of Prisons, Prisons medical facility. I will have to work the rest of my life to repair everything I've done, Schubert told the judge before sentencing. Schubert's attorney, Jason Holden, said cloning the giant Marco Polo sheep hunted in Kyrgyzstan in 2013 has ruined his client's life, reputation, and family. I think this has broken him, Holden said. Holden, in, seek in seeking a probationary sentence, argued that Schubert was a hardworking man who has always cared for animals and did something that no one else could have done in cloning the giant sheep, which he named Montana Mountain King or MMK. 
The animal has been confiscated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and is being held in an accredited facility until it can be transferred to a zoo. Oh, let's not live, let it live in the plains of Montana. Let's put it in a prison. Let's imprison the animal. What the hell? A special. What? Sorry, we're putting the animal in prison? Get the fuck out of here. All right. <laughs> it's been transferred for the zoo, said Richard Berry, a special agent with the Wildlife Service. Sarah Brown, the attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice had asked that Shoebarth be sentenced to prison, saying his illegal breeding operation was widespread, involved other states, and endangered the health of other wildlife. The crime involved forethought, which is complex and involved many illegal acts, she said. Shoebarth owns Sun River Enterprises, LLC, a 215-acre alternative livestock ranch, which buys, sells, and breeds alternative livestock, such as mountain sheep, mountain goats, and ungulates. Ungulates. What the hell's an ungulate? <coughs> we just invented another word here. What the hell's an ungulate? U N G U L A A T E S. Ungulates. Hmm. Primarily for private hunting preserves where people shoot captive trophy game animals for a fee, prosecutor said. He had been in the game farm business since 1987, she worked, said. Schubert pleaded guilty in March to charges that he and five other people conspired to use tissue from a Marco Polo sheep illegally brought into the U.S. to clone that animal and then used the clone and its descendants to create a larger hybrid species of sheep that would be more valuable for captive hunting operations. You're raising these animals to shoot them and put them on the wall. No other reason. Okay, whatever. Marco Polo sheep are the largest in the world, can weigh 300 pounds, and have curled horns up to 5 feet. Oh, big old monsters. 5 feet curled up horns long. I mean, they're, they're curled. I don't know if they uncurl them, they're 5 feet. I don't know what that means. Chubar told... Chubar sold semen from MMK along with hybrid sheep to three people in Texas, while a Minnesota resident, resident bought 74 sheep brought 74 sheep to Shoebrush Ranch for them to be inseminated at various times during the conspiracy court records show. Shoebrush sold one direct offspring from M MMK for $10,000 and other sheep with lesser MMK genetics for smaller amounts. The total value of the animals involved was greater than $250,000, but less than $550,000, prosecutors said. Hybrid sheep were also sold to people in Alabama, Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Ohio, Oregon, South Dakota, West Virginia, prosecutors said. In October 2019, court records said Shoebirth paid a hunting guide $400 for the testicles of a trophy sized Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep <laughs> that had been harvested in Montana and then extracted and sold the semen, court records said. Sheep breeds that are not allowed in Montana were brought into the state as part of a conspiracy, including 43 sheep from Texas, prosecutors said. Prosecutors said, prosecutors said, after every sentence here. You were so focused on getting those, around those rules, you got off track, Morris said. Holden sought reduced restitution, saying Starbirth fed and cared for the hybrid sheep at his ranch until they could be slaughtered and meat donated to a food bank. The remaining hybrid sheep with Marco Polo DNA in his ranch must be sent to slaughter by the end of the year with the meat also being donated. Morris said. Morris gave Shoebarth until December 2025 to sell his Rocky Mountain Bighorn hybrid sheep. Shoebarth will not be allowed to breed game stock during the three years he's on probation. The five co-conspirators were not named in court records, but Shoebarth's plea agreement requires him to fully cooperate, cooperate fully with prosecutors to testify if called to do so. The case is still being investigated. Montana wildlife officials, according to Montana wildlife officials. Schubert, in a letter attached to his sentencing memo, memo, said he becomes extremely passionate about any project he takes on, including his sheet project, and is ashamed of his actions. I got my normal mindset clouded by my enthusiasm and look for any gray area in the law to make the best sheep I could for this sheep, or the best sheep I could for this sheep industry. And my family has never, has never been broke, but we are now. So there's your update on the Montana guy cloning sheep, and we also have one more story to get into a quick one. Another weird story: Direct TV. If you've owned Direct, if you've owned Direct TV, you've known that they're not exactly that great. But Dish TV has been their competition for years. 
even though they're kind of in the same. I, I thought they were the same company. Apparently, weren't. DirecTV has bought Dish Network for one dollar, joining a club of properties sold for one buck. It's from Todd Spangler from Variety.com. In non-sheep news, DirecTV will write a check for one whole U.S. dollar, one hundred cents. <laughs> yeah. 100 cents to buy one-time rival Dish Network and its Sling TV business. Of course, that's not the only financial component of the transaction where we created the largest U.S. provider in the declining pay TV industry with around 18 million customers. DirecTV will take out on about $9.75 billion of debt that is currently on the books of Dish parent company, EchoStar. Effectively, EchoStar is giving away its shrinking satellite and streaming TV business in order to get rid of a huge chunk of debt so it can focus on building out a wireless services play. Why does DirecTV's deal for DISH even include the nominal consideration of $1? For one thing, the transactions often require some type of payment to become illegally binding. A single dollar sale price is usually assigned to the deal involves a property saddled with significant liabilities. That's right. What are you buying for $1? You're buying $9.75 billion in debt. That's what you're buying. Here's a look at some of the other famous $1 deal. Barstool Sports in October 2023, David Portnoy bought back the audacious sports and pop culture media company founder from gambling operator Penn Entertainment for $1 after Penn had shelled out about $550 million to acquire 100% control of Barstool and ultimately unsuccessful bid to integrate the Barstool brand into its online betting business. After the deals announced, Portnoy said he's never going to sell Barstool Barstool Sports ever. I'll hold it until I die. Barstool Sports, I'll listen to it. <laughs> it's unlistenable. It's just idiots that don't know anything talking about sports. And they're usually politically, let's call them ignorant. Politically ignorant. So you just say things that are just, oh, I don't care. I'll just be ignorant. And then they say things that are, oh, we get clicks when we say stupid ignorant shit. That's Barstool Sports in a nutshell. Saying ignorant shit, getting people pissed off, getting clicks. Newsweek, there's other $1. We'll run through these real, real quick. Newsweek, the Washington Post company, sold the erstwhile Newsweekly print powerhouse in 2010 to audio mogul Sidney Harmon for $1 to assume its liabilities. TV Guide in 2008, a venture capital firm Open Gate Capital bought TV Guide for $1 from Macrovision, the TV tech company that acquired the Jumpstart TV Guide for its on screen interactive program guide. The rights to Terminator, the film franchise. Back in 1984, James Cameron, over half, over half of the rights to Terminator for, sold over half of the rights to Terminator 1 for $1 to Gail Ann Hudd, Cameron's former producing partner and ex-wife, before they made the first film in exchange for guarantee would, wouldn't be replaced as director. Cameron has expressed regret about the decision. If I had little time in the machine, I could only, and I could only send back something the length of a tweet. It would be, don't sell, he told to Toronto Sun in the 2009 interview. So, yeah. There's your other deals for $1. Good deals if you can get it. Of course, you got to be able to absorb all that debt. Yep. But usually it's a, a good deal for the stock make, the stockholders, because they can, they can, uh, I don't know, on a distress sale like that, that gets a kind of tax loophole right off. Those are your stories on Weird Wednesday, Section 2. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a very hard ethical question, the sheep, right, the sheep story. Like, yeah. I didn't ask to become a clone. Why am I getting slaughtered for? It's like, you're an illegal sheep. Your DNA is yeah, illegal. Uh, you must be yeah. killed. <laughs> yeah. They never heard of petting zoos. Yeah, just they don't want they don't want some monster sheep roaming the landscape. <laughs> just let them die of their very short been... lives, because most cloned animals nah, don't live very sheep. long. Oh. Dude can make it. The dude can make a fortune writing a book while he's in prison called "Attack of the Mutant Sheep," <laughs> and you know that's what I'm. That's what I would do. Do androids dream of night. mutant sheep? Yeah. <laughs> the Blade the Runner, re, the Blade Runner reimagining. <laughs> right. 
That's so. When I get to video, yeah. I got to I mean, video. I'll be sending it in a minute. Illegal cloning, okay. sure, you know, go to jail. But I don't understand why the sheep have to die for that. <clears throat> Rest in peace, the cloned sheep. Uh, in more wacky news, right. let's talk about banning poverty, or sorry, outlawing poverty by banning begging. So, in, this is in Sweden, on The Guardian by Miranda Bryant. The Swedish government has been accused of trying to outlaw poverty after it presented plans for a national begging ban. How you're going to reinforce begging bans, I don't know. Like, what if I go up to my friend and say, yo, can I borrow 20 bucks? I forgot my wallet at home. You're begging! Somebody arrest this guy! The center-right coalition, backed by the far right, of course it's the far right, Sweden Democrats, has announced a nine-month inquiry into implementation. I'm sorry, like, it's hard to be impartial when it's only the far right that are doing stupid stuff. <laughs> Let's do this stupid thing. Why? I don't know, because we're the stupid party and we do stupid stuff. They have announced a nine-month inquiry into the implementation of a national begging ban, saying that if it's deemed feasible, such a prohibition prohibition could become law. I can tell you already now, right now, without a nine-month inquiry, it's not feasible. At a present, at press conference on Monday, which was the 30th of September, Sweden Democrat Group leader Linda Lindberg told took aim at people she claimed were coming from other EU countries just to beg outside our shops. Ah. Uh, Classic anti-immigration rhetoric right here. Obviously, only the bad people are the people who aren't from here. And everyone from here is good and perfect and not criminal. Sweden cannot, she say, act as Europe's conscience. But Stockholm's Stad Mission, a Christian social organization working with vulnerable people in the capital, condemned the move. Fanny Stil Siltberg, a spokesperson, said, Bad begging or to require permission to beg is just shifting the problem in a futile attempt to outlaw poverty. I mean, we should outlaw poverty, but like not in a criminal way, in a positive way, you know? Oh, you're not, it's illegal for us to let you be poor, so we're gonna give you support. She added, instead we believe that this group's vulnerability can be reduced through structural poverty, reduction and work against discrimination. That sounds like great stuff both in home countries and within the EU. It is long-term work. In the meantime, society needs to take responsibility for exam responsibility. For example, offering paths into the workplace, the housing market, and in the way, reduce the social vulnerability of these people. Ida Samani, the Deputy Legal Director of the human rights organization Civil Rights Defenders, that the government could face legal action if it goes ahead with the proposal. It is remarkable that the government is prioritizing this in a situation that they themselves describe as a crisis of organized and violent crime. That, then there's the question of the lawfulness of a ban. As far as I can see, a national ban on begging would most likely not be lawful. I agree with you there. Banning begging, she added, would contravene the right to a private life and freedom of expression, as expressed in the European Convention on Human Rights. Ah, oh, darn it! The damn Human Rights Convention getting in the way again! Why did we join the EU? The protecting people's rights enshrined in the Swedish Constitution. The government said the begging has risen in Sweden. How do you know the numbers of begging? I guess they went out on the street and they like see, like they, they had a little tally marker and then I'm gonna walk down the main street of Stockholm Oh, that's one. Oh, that's another one. I want to get a job they, toning beggars. Yeah, and then they come back. They come back like in 2020 and where they do it again. Like, oh my god, it's gone from 20 people asking me to 50 people asking me. Oh, I, I'm really curious how they figured out the, the risen begging. How it's risen since maybe 2010. Follow, the money, however. Maybe they can tax them. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Where did you get this money from? Oh, from begging. Okay, we'll write that in your taxes. Where, right, where's your taxes? <laughs> We're taking 10 I mean, I'm begging right now. Am I going to get banned in Sweden? Hey, guys, don't forget to subscribe, donate to our uh, Patreon or all that stuff. Not donate. Subscribe to our Patreon. Please give us money. 
I gotta make a cardboard sign and hold it up. <laughs> Poor unemployed YouTuber, please give cash. Okay. I'm a veteran. Yeah. <laughs> it's always on a sign. Veteran with ba back pain. You don't have to indicate where the back pain came from. Veteran with back pain, please <laughs> give cash. Uh. Samani, however, questioned oh, the instinct in which begging is a problem for the country. Oh, yes. I also question that. Civil rights defender said it would be monitoring the situation and could mount a legal challenge if it becomes law. I'll I'll be there. I'll I'm not even part of Sweden. I'll be like, this is dumb. The proposed begging ban is part of an overall shift towards more oppressive policies in criminal and migration policy, Samani said, and a disregarding of human rights and freedoms. The proposal, which has been in the works since the formation of the government two years ago, has already caused disagreement with the coalition of moderates, the liberals, and Christian Democrats. Yeah, I don't think Christian de Democrats, I mean, I hope they're not going, yeah, a begging ban, great idea. It's like, what? Christian, you need to take that word out of your, your name. Christians love giving money away and helping the homeless. As far as I know, that's what they should love doing. Anna Starbrink, a liberal MP, wrote on Facebook, I will not contribute to the introduction of such a ban. Of course, measures are needed to prevent exploitation of vulnerable people, but people in need cannot be forbidden for asking for help. Sweden Democrats provided outside support to the government. So, there is your story, your wacky and weird story about Sweden's far-right government saying, you know what, let's ban begging. I'm sure that would be enforceable and nothing bad will happen. On to your story. All right. Come from beggars and complainers to physics. Yeah, we're gonna talk about physics today. Physics is always a little strange because it tries to explain things with theories that it has to adjust. Ah. Scientificamerican.com has a story from Manan Bischoff and Jenna, or Gianna Reiner. Evidence of negative time found in quantum physics experiment. What? Negative time? Yeah, that's right. Negative time. Physicists showed that photons can seem to exit material before entering it, revealing other observational evidence of negative time. What? Quantum physicists are familiar with wonky, seemingly nonsensical phenomena. Atoms and molecules sometimes act as particles, sometimes as waves. Particles can be connected to one another by a spooky action at a distance, even over great distances. And quantum objects can detach themselves from other properties, like the Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland detaches itself from its grin. Now researchers, led by Dianella... Angulo of the University of Toronto, Daniela, sorry, of the University of Toronto, have revealed another oddball quantum outcome. Photons, wave particles of light, which are wave particles of light, can spend a negative amount of time zipping through a cloud of uh, chilled atoms. In other words, photons can seem to exit the material before entering it. It took a positive amount of time but our experiment observe, observing that photons can make atoms seem to spend a negative amount of time in this excited state is up, wrote a. a. Fram Steinberg, a physicist at the University of Toronto, in a post on social media about the new study, which was uploaded to the preprint server argxiv.org on September 5th and has not yet been peer reviewed. So it's not pre-reviewed. It might just be this guy just trying to scam you. I don't know. <laughs> the idea for this work emerged in, emerged in 2017. At the time, Steinberg and a lab colleague, then doctoral student Josiah Sinclair, were interested in the interaction of light and matter, specifically a phenomenon called atomic excitation, when protons pass through a medium and get absorbed, electrons swirling around atoms in that medium jump to a higher energy level. When these excited electrons lapse to their original state, they release that absorbed energy as re-emitted protons, in introducing a time delay in the light's observed transit time through the medium. Ooh, that was hard to understand. 
Sinclair's team wanted to measure that time delay, which is sometimes technically called a group delay, and learn whether it depends on the fate of the proton. Was it scattered and absorbed inside the atomic cloud, or was it transmitted with no interaction whatsoever? At the time, we weren't sure what the answer was, and we felt like such a basic question about something so fundamental should be easy to answer, Sinclair says. But the more people walk, we talked to, the more we realized that while everyone had their own intuition or guess, there was no expert consensus on what the right answer would be because the nature of those delays can be so strange and counterintuitive. Some researchers had written the phenomenon off as effectively meaningless for describing any physical property associated with light. After three years of planning, the team developed an apparatus to test this question in the lab. Their experiments involved shooting protons through a cloud of ultra-cold rubidium atoms and measuring the results, the resulting degree of atomic excitation. Two surprises emerged from the experiment. Sometimes photons would pass through the un through unscathed, yet the rubidium atoms would still become excited, and for just as long as if they had absorbed those protons. Stranger still, when photons were absorbed. They would seem to be re-emitted almost instantly, well before the rubidium atoms returned to their ground state. As at the protons, on average, relieving the atoms quicker than expected. The team then collaborated with Howard Weissman, a theoretical and quantum physicist at Gritham, Griffith University in Australia, to devise an explanation. The theoretical framework that emerged showed that the time these transmitted photons spent in the atomic excitation matched perfectly with the expected group delay acquired by the light, even before cases where it seemed as though the photons were remitted before the atomic excitation had ebbed. To understand the nonsensical finding, you can think of protons as a fuzzy quantum objects they are, in which any given photon's absorption and re-emission through an atomic excitation is not guaranteed to occur over a certain fixed amount of time. Rather, it takes place across a smeared out probabilistic range of temporal values. As demonstrated by the team experiments, these values can encompass instances when an individual proton's transmit time is instantaneous or bizarrely when it concludes before the atomic excitation as succeeds, which gives it a negative value. I can promise you that we were completely surprised by this prediction, Sinclair says, referring to the matchup between the group's delay, the group delay and the time that the transmit of photons spent in as atomic excitation. And as soon as we were confident we had made a mistake. As soon as we were confident we had made a mistake, Steinberg and the rest of the team, I had moved on to a postdoc at the Massachusetts I had moved on to a postdoc by this point, began planning to do a follow-up experiment to test the crazy prediction of negative dwell time and see if the theory would hold up. That follow-up experiment, the one that led to, let, the one led by our Gulu that Steinberg touted on social media, can be understood by considering the two ways a photon can be transmitted. In one, the photon wears blinders of sorts and ignores the atom entirely, leaving without even a nod. In the other, it interacts with the atom, boosting it to a higher energy level before getting remitted. When you see a transmitted proton, you can't know which of these occurred, Steinberg said. That because protons are quantum particles at the quantum realm, the two outcomes can be in superposition. Both things can happen at the same time. The meaning, the measuring device, ends up with a superposition of measuring zero and measuring some small positive value. But correspondingly, Steinberg notes, it also means that sometimes the measuring device ends up in a state that looks not like zero plus, but something positive, like zero minus something positive, resulting in what looks like a, the wrong sign, a negative value for this excitation in time. The measurement results in Angulo and her colleagues' experiment suggests that the photons move through the medium faster when they excited the atoms than when the atoms remained in their ground state. And a negative time delay may seem paradoxical, but what it means is that if you build a quantum clock to measure how much time atoms are spending in an excited state, the clock 
hand would, under certain circumstances, move backward rather than forward, Sinclair says. In other words, the time in which the photons were absorbed by atoms is negative. Even though the phenomenon is astonishing, it has no impact on our understanding of time itself, but it does illustrate once again that the quantum world still has surprises in store. Angulo and the rest of the team have accomplished something really impressive and produced a beautiful set of measurements. The results are raised interesting questions about the history of photons traveling through absorb absorptive media and necessitate a reinterpretation of the physical meaning of the group delay and optics. So a lot of technical jargon, a lot of, a lot of physics, uh, double talk there for you, I apologize. Hard to understand, but my little take on this is, okay, you're measuring time. What are you using to measure time? A man-made device. And since time doesn't actually exist in the real world, it's just something we invented. It's, yeah. a, it's a thing we invented in our brains to quantify the days of the week and everything. It isn't actually a thing. Yeah, time isn't you just can, you can have an experiment where it seems that there. time moves backwards. Yeah. Right. Well, we're just humans. We're trying to explain the natural world. Back to you. Okay. Then let's go to our culture segment oh, yeah. here, which is about how time right has on. passed. We're all old, and now they're making emo retrospective exhibitions in London. This is from David Morquand on your news culture. Mom, it's not a phase. I'm not okay. The exhibition celebrating emo culture launches in London and runs until January 2025. Sounds like a great Christmas, uh, Christmas present. I don't know for your ex emo slash still. There's still emo people out there. I was never emo, but I love listening to the music. Crack out your darkest eyeliner. Put on my chemical romance and prepare to yell. I'm not oh fucking K because there's a new exhibition at the Barbican Music Library in London that celebrates emo culture at its finest or darkest, whatever applies. Currently on and with doors open until the 15th of January, 2025, I'm not okay in emo retrospective explores the rise of Britain's Y2K subculture, focusing on the first generation emo scene from 2004 to 2009. Ah, I remember that. The UK, I don't know about the US because it's a bit bigger of a country. But I know that the UK because it's small. I remember people going crazy while parents going, My child is, you know, sacrificing goats to the devil or something. Like, like that's the reaction to emo culture in the UK. There was a very virulent reaction. Politicians were like, This music is destroying our children. You know, the... The, the classic like anti-metal rhetoric that politicians did in the US and it was just like lots of emo emos in the UK were being treated like pariahs of society for those of you scratching their heads and not currently vibing to fallout boy here's a quick refresher emo is a music genre that stems from I don't if fallout boy is an emo music but anyways let's not start arguing about what genre belongs where Emo is a music genre that stems from the word emotional or the term emotional hardcore, a style of music in the mid 80s that was characterized by songs, introspective lyrics, and influenced by The Smiths, Joy Division, and The Cure. I know you guys at least know who that is. Stereotypically, emo tends to be associated with sensitivity, shyness, and a bucket load of angst, which often translates a social alienation and introversion. Or controversially, the stereotypes extend to destructive behavior and depression or self-harm. But unless you have subscription to British tabloid Daily Mail, emo is a subculture that offers a vehicle for creativity and self-expression, and is not characterized by harmful cliches like links to anger and extreme sadness. In the 2000s, or the double aughts, emo was reinvented by alt-rock and indie bands like Jimmy Eat World, Dashboard Conventional, My Chemical Romance, and Fall Out Boy. I really don't consider Fall Out Boy emo, but I guess David is. I don't, I've never seen them as an emo band. It's fine. I can name a few. And their album gained mainstream success. The problem with Fall Out Boy is they maybe had one emo album, and then the the, re the rest of their albums weren't that. Because uh, they are 
not really belong to a genre like that. Summer of 2002 was a huge time for emo culture. Uh, fun fact, Gerard Way, the singer for My Chemical Romance, uh, only made My Chemical Romance because of 9-11. So that's probably why it got a big boost in 2002. Um, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, uh, that was pretty depressing. It wouldn't make anybody kind of emotionally hardcore. With Jimmy Eats World's The Middle topping charts and paving the way for the likes of Good Charlotte, who is from Waldorf, Maryland, a place just north of where I grew up. Well, for my Valentine, which is a Welsh. I would call, I, I would consider Bull for my Valentine emo metal. Uh, but they're from, they're from Wales. The Used, I don't know where the Used is from. I think they're probably from like Utah or something. And the Disco um, and Paramore. I really wouldn't consider Paramore <laughs> Nemo music or kind of kind of this go. The subculture extended to fashion as tight skinny trousers, band t-shirts, studded belt, gap black. I would call those scene. Or there's another subculture called scene kids. I would say Panic the Disco and Paramore were for the scene kids. Maybe in Volt, Volt for my Valentine, but I would not say they're emo. I don't know. Good Charlotte. Yeah, good Charlotte. The subculture also extended to fashion as tight skinny trousers, band t-shirts, studded belts, jet black hair, and clothing, as well as plenty of eyeliner, were a must for emo kids. There, you're almost caught up in the history of emo. I'm Not Okay, an emo retrospective, which is named after My Chemical Romance's hit, I'm Not Okay, I Promise. From the band's second LP, Three Cheers for Sweet Revenge, is a collaboration between Barbican Music Library and the Museum of Youth Culture. Though at this point, it's middle midlife crisis culture, I think, not youth culture. <laughs> All the emos are 30 now. According to Barbican, the exhibition highlights how the ethos of emo resonated deeply with the generation channeling collective teenage melancholy into a transatlantic subculture that thrived in cyberspace just as well as in the basement venues of grody pubs. It features photo snap. It was, I think, I want to say emo was probably the first subculture that had wide access to the internet in this way, which is why it was transatlantic. Because there was nothing to stop you. You could just go on MySpace, the real ones know, and put your emo music on your profile page and make it all black and everyone would be like, wow, you have a cool MySpace page. I love, um, let me think of a, I just forgot their name. I can't think of a band. Never mind. I love the Smiths. Whatever. I love the Cure. I had a band in my head, but I lost the band instantly. Uh, a feature of photos snapped on early digital and mid 00 phone cameras and explores the subculture became a positive force when it came to addressing issues of mental health, identity, sexuality, and belonging. Yeah, I'm going through a tough time right now, so I have been listening to a lot of my emo music so that I can just scream my feelings out into the world and to my neighbors. The Museum, Museum of Youth Culture's creative director, Jamie Brett said, as well as the content that we unearthed digitally, we are very grateful to everyone who remembered how emo culture helped shape their lives and answered our shout outs for visual material for exhibitions, essentially giving them a degree of ownership of it. We are all hugely proud of I'm Not Okay, an emo retrospective, and over the course of its four month run at the Barbican Music Library, the museum's team is looking forward to hearing how it evokes vivid memories of this pivotal time in people's lives, added Brett. So, go down in the early round, because sugar, we're going down swinging. It's a, it's a lyric from Fall Out Boy. That's why <laughs> he rolled my eyes. Uh, to the Barbican website, for more information, you'll see there an open sharing your moving rendition of Fall Out Boy Sugar, We're Going Down, should the Barbican get in touch. I'm not okay, and emo retrospective is now open until January 15, 2025. Where is it located, though? I would like an address. I know they said it was in London. It's in London uh, by St. Paul's Cathedral, just north of St. Paul's Cathedral. So if you know where that is, it's there. It's a. Uh, I mean, it's in a place called Barbican. So you know that that's the stop on the tube. If you want to get, if you're using public transport, you can get off on Barbican. Also, Moorgate, if you are on a different line, probably. 
and it's right there on uh, in that area. And they have a kitchen, mm. so there's also food. Get hungry. Oh, uh, that's my mm. alter segment about being emo in the early 2000s. Um, even though I was never really emo, right. but I listened to all the music. But I, I, everyone was wearing eyeliner back then. But I didn't have any black clothes. Well, you mentioned Good Charlotte. Yeah, I you mentioned I Good loved, Charlotte. They're from Waldorf. Yeah, that's what I said. Waldorf, I loved wearing Maryland, purple right more there. than I liked wearing black. So I guess I was a purple. I was a purple emo. I was definitely emo. I was quite depressed uh, in high school. But anyway, you weren't wearing <laughs> black. You weren't wearing the black makeup. No, no, I wasn't wearing. I did not dye my hair black. I dyed my hair orange. That was a mistake. Uh, anyways, <laughs> that was a paramore problem. That's my you that's my Wednesday segment. Adams. Yeah, let's go to this day in history. You didn't go the full Wednesday, Adams. Um. All right. So national day calendar and what happened on this day in history? This day in history. Da, 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 da. 1780, British Army officer John Andre was executed by the Americans as a spy after conducting secret meetings with American General Benedict Arnold during the American Revolution. A couple of traitors. 1879, American poet Wallace Stevens was born in Reading, Pennsylvania, or Reading, Pennsylvania. I guess that's pronounced Reading, Pennsylvania. His work explores the interaction of reality and what man can make of reality in his mind. In 1935, Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie ordered mobilization upon learning that Italian forces had crossed the frontier to begin the Italo-Ethiopian Italo War. Aptly named. 1957, the American War the British American War classic, The Bridge on the River Kwai, had its world premiere and later won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Bridge on the River Kwai. Not to give it all away, but they blow up the bridge at the end. 1959. What's that? Didn't somebody die from that movie? Like a real person actually died in the production of the movie that's about that event? Oh, I don't know. I wasn't around. <laughs> Sounds like an old Hollywood story that maybe you can investigate. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Uh, submitted for your approval. The Twilight Zone began this day in 1959. Yes, right. The science fiction anthology, anthology TV series, The Twilight Zone, debuted and became hugely popular. Known for its unexpected plot twists and moral lessons, this show was created by Rod Serling. Submitted for your approval. A man who is, can't find his shoes. You know, it's always some ridiculous situation that some poor bastard is in. They can't explain the Twilight Zone. 1967, Thurgood Marshall was sworn in as Associate Justice for the U.S. Supreme Court, becoming its first African-American member. He was a civil rights activist, and of course, the key lawyer in Brown Blues versus Board of Education was desegregated American school. 1985, Rock Hudson died, becoming the, one of the first Hollywood celebrities known to succumb to age-related complications. The extensive publicity surrounding his death drew attention to the disease, and Ronald Reagan finally started paying attention to AIDS because Rock, Rock Hudson was Nancy Reagan's friend. And oh my God, it can happen to people I know. It must be serious. So. <laughs> But five years after AIDS appeared, the Reagan started taking it seriously. 2005, Pulitzer Prize winning playwright August Wilson, who is best known for his cycle of plays, each set in a different decade of 20th century of black American life, died at the age of 60. A lot of people died on this day. Holy crap. Speaking of people who died on this day, Tom Petty died on this day in 2017. The great American singer and songwriter Tom Petty, who's Roots-oriented guitar rock arose from the new wave movement in the late 1970s, resulted in a string of hit singles. I totally forgot he, he died. He 66, and he died. Yeah, he died in 2017 from complication of taking too many different medications. Uh oh. Because he had Watch a for physical ailment that he was taking painkillers for, and the doctor put him on antidepressants. He go, ah, oh, no. go ahead and combine these with your opioids. 
Yeah. Opioids and antidepressants. What could happen? What could happen? Uh, physical ailments got to him. So Tom Petty, sad day. Rest in peace, Tom. A lot of great songs. Yeah. And one of those bands, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, that re yeah. recorded all of their songs live. They did no overdubs. Well, occasionally they did overdubs. Like the song "No Come Around Here No More" is definitely a lot of overdubs. But that was that was produced by Dave Stewart, so it doesn't count. <laughs> but Tom Petty typically would just rehearse, 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 get the song right, and then record it live in one take, or 50 takes, or in the case of Refugee, I think it was 197 takes before they finally got a take they liked, and everybody in the band's like, I never want to play that song again. <laughs> Our featured event in 1836, Charles Darwin returned to England. Naturalist Charles Darwin returned to England on this day in 1836 after a five-year journey on the HMS Beagle in which he gathered the specimens and observations that led to his theory of evolution by natural selection. So he's smart, intelligent, informed scientist. And of course, to this day, people are like, oh, you can't prove it. You can't prove it. You can't prove it. Meanwhile, they want you to accept creationism blindly. Yep. <laughs> I want you to prove evolution. Like, eh, we'll accept that creation story, which makes no fucking sense. We'll accept that blindly. Anyway, not not carefully thought out doctrine, not carefully thought out experimentation. We'll just accept things blind. Anyway, creationists are funny people. I don't believe in science. Well, science believes in you, so it doesn't even matter whether you believe it or not. Anyway. A uh, feature biography, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, born on this day, October 2nd, 1869 in Porbandar, India. He only made it to age 78. He was assassinated. He died January 30th, 1948, age 78 in Delhi, India. Other famous birthdays today, Paul von Hindenburg, German president, uh, dirigible named after him, born in 19... 1847, sorry. We did Mahatma Gandhi. Johnny Cochran, O.J. Simpson's infamous lawyer, born in 1937. Annie Leibowitz, born in 1949, American photographer. You may not know Annie Leibowitz. You've probably seen a lot of her pictures, though. Sting was born in this day. Born Gordon Sumner in 1951. And those are your birthdays for today. It's National Day Calendar. It's a lot of crap today. For some reason, it's a lot of crap. It's National Produce Misting Day. I don't know if they do this in Europe or other countries, but in the produce section, they have these little misters that spray a little bit of misty spray every periodically on all the veg vegetables to keep them... I don't know. Um, wet. <laughs> I have to say, no. To keep them wet. I have not seen that once no, in... Haven't. The UK, in France, in the D Netherlands, in Germany, we didn't see it. I didn't see it anywhere. So. Nobody's missing Greece, their produce. It wasn't in happening in Greece. You'd think uh, you'd do it in Greece because it's pretty hot there, but they weren't doing it there either. Yeah. It'll probably evaporate pretty quickly in Greece because of the dry climate. Random acts of pro poetry day. I think, therefore, I am. I think. <laughs> Random acts of poetry. So, random acts of poetry. Think of a poetry. There once was a man from Berlin or something. <laughs> National <laughs> Custodial Workers Recognition Day. So, if you got a if you're a custodian or janitor, as we call them here, in yeah. Shout term, out to one of my chatters, D Man. He used to be a janitor until Fuck that yeah. stuff. Janitors that shit are very important. Pissed him off so much that he got. I think he got fired technically, but it, it was probably for the best. I've done that job myself when I was going to college, when yep. I was going to trade school, I was a janitor at night. Name your car day. Now, if you name your car, you're really into it. So I won't, I won't fault you on that. You gotta have something in life to motivate you. Why the hell not name your car? Call him Kit, like for Knight Rider, maybe. Or her. I think cars should be a her, just like a ship, right? Anyway, National Fried Scallops Day. I love scallops, can't eat them. I get about four scallops in me, and after that, and then I get you die. 
It's National Pumpkin Seed Day. I love pumpkin seeds. If you hollow out that pumpkin, take your seeds, spread them out in a big old cookie sheet, sprinkle them liberally with salt, and bake them for like 27.5 minutes at 350 degrees, and you'll get crispy, crispy, tasty, salted pumpkin seeds. That's my little tip. National Coffee with a Cop Day. We covered that today, earlier. It's National Smarties Day. Smarties are little, those little, little cylinder, little, tiny little pill shaped, chalky little candies, candies all different yeah. flavors that are really dry like chalk. Yeah. Smarties. You get those for Halloween. They're like throw ins for Halloween. You get them in our afterthought. They're like the afterthought candy, right? I love them the and, most, though. Oh. I, what? Yeah. And we'll just keep going. It's National Walk to School Day, which I couldn't do. It was 13 miles to school when I was a kid. But I some kids can walk to school. National to Walk to school. to school Day. Yeah, three hours <laughs> of walk to get to school. Maybe you can walk while you're on the bus. Just keep walking up and down the aisle while you're on the bus. Yeah, and then get kicked off the bus because the bus driver right, like, those... I'm not going to be responsible for you breaking your neck on the bus. Yeah. I don't have hey, liability insurance. You're making my life hard. <laughs> but those are your stories and those are your days. Those are your what happened in this day for October 2nd, 2024 on Before Fried Scallops. Fried scallops are great as long as it's not breaded because uh, that bread just like removes all the flavors. Yeah, like I, I can't even taste this thing. I just taste the batter. I don't think I've had scallops in any form except their base form. Yeah. Fried. <laughs> this has been Allison here from the Netherlands. I hope you guys enjoyed our wacky and weird news and how, yeah. And if you understood any of that physics, uh, that Raj went over, let us know yeah, in the man. comments down below about trying to yeah, see man. time and the atoms of the protons of time, I guess. <laughs> and we will be back tomorrow for Thursday's 13. I don't know what 13 things we're listing, so make sure you subscribe if you're not already and have that notification bell turned on so you can get notified when we start listing 13 things for 30 minutes. <laughs> not going to be that long. Yeah, another thing. Photons are leaving before they get there. Yeah. Just put it that way. Photons are leaving before they get there. It's like your um, friend Phil comes over. My, my friend Phil already left. Well, he hasn't been here yet. Well, just wait. He, he left already. Well, here he is now. He just got here. Yeah, but he already left. Huh? That's impossible. Well, anyway, since time doesn't exist, I can see this actually being. All happening. those things but can anyway, happen anyway, at once and be factual. But we will see you tomorrow. Take care out there. Pick up time as a dimension. If you understand you can't physics, anyway. quantum mechanics, and uh, let's look at our mic drop moment that hopefully works. It, All right. It's not. Oh, it's it's right. Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. Twilight Here we go. That's for sure. Here we go. And a black intro there. The first, the first, the first episode of the Twilight Zone. The first day. two minutes of the first episode of the Twilight Zone. Know how to push a 65 years ago today. My presence here is for much the same purpose, simply to push a product. To acquaint you with an entertainment product, which we hope and which we rather expect will make your product pushing that much easier. What you're about to see, gentlemen, is a series called The Twilight Zone. My product pushing. What you're about to see is not real. Series. Essentially, people watch television to get entertained. And the keynote of this series, the thing we're concerned with, the thing we're aiming for... No, he breaks the fourth wall, he stands by the camera. Yeah. This is a series for the storyteller. Mm. Because it's I think they just wanted to make it clear to people that what you're watching is watch well not real, story. even though they filmed it in a way that, that it came off, off as real, right? The high quality of this series. Let me very I, could, I, I could understand. How many people, people thought TV was real? Yeah, well, there's people people you know, today who will be general, logging on to a program and they bad, think it's a real documentary about real things. What's happening? Right, It'll be a mockumentary, sure. you know. So I hope you'll bear so with you me gotta, while I tell you about a few stories. Sadly, you do have to tell the, the audience this is not real. This is a cycle. this is a thought experiment here. This is sand. It represents desert. Ah, uh, science. Desert that you'll see on your screen. Looks like sand. It's more science, yeah. The lonely. 
The Lonely is about a man sentenced to a lifetime of solitary confinement. The confinement takes place on a sandy asteroid far out in space. It's the story about a man slowly succumbing to a kind of nightmarish loneliness. A he has a really interesting mouth style when he speaks. Human beings have that yeah. palpable need for companionship. A most benevolent and compassionate official sends the prisoner a long rectangular box. Now he's when I was a kid, I was like, Brad Sterling looks like he's about to punch somebody in the face. Yeah, he's like holding his anger back. <laughs> in the form of a yeah. It's a robot that... Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.